tell us all about where you lived and about the house and all that good stuff. Well, let, let me tell you about it. I don't remember when I was there. All right, we lived in a, actually, we lived about, I remember when we were about six and eight years old, mm -hmm. or maybe even ten years old. We lived for, for a couple of years, we lived in a, we lived or not in a hotel. Wow. Because my, my father owned the hotel. And so we like, we had a floor in the hotel, and that's where we lived. Tell you a little bit more, okay, we lived in this hotel, which was in the second district of Vienna, which was close to the a great big park, which was called the Prater, and also very close to a big amusement center. Right? And uh, so we used to go there quite often and run and ride the merry-go-round and stuff like that. And not only merry-go-round, they have in this particular place, which is called the Prater in, in Austria, in Vienna, they have this huge, huge ferry, Ferris wheel, which is, I think, the only one in the world. And they used, they used that, well, there was some sort of a World's Fair in those days, I mean, that was before my kind of thing. And that's when they built it and then they kept there. And they have, instead of just seats, they have little cars like on a, like a, uh, on a ra railroad or like a, on a trolley car or something. They're real cars where you, like maybe for 10 or 12 people inside. And once there was a movie, and they still play there was so often. If you ever see, make sure, if it's ever on scene, it's called The Third Man. And that was sort of a, a mystery movie or something. And that played in Vienna, and there's all kind of action right on that particular Ferris wheel, you know. Somebody wants to throw the other one down or something like that. You know? okay. But anyway, we stayed there until we were about 10, until I was 10 years old, and Fred was uh, 11 and a half. And at that particular time, my mother and father got divorced. Now, as far as I remember, and I, my memory is fairly good, for, for things way, way back, you know, not, not for when I put with my keys or, 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 <laughs> or something like that, or what kind of a date I have this particular day, meaning, uh, meaning not a date, just sort of an appointment, obviously. You know? <laughs> I don't have an offer of dates nowadays, <laughs> but <laughs> did you want me to be funny? So anyway, um, mm -hmm. It wasn't a very traumatic thing because, at least not for me, my parents got divorced. My father bought us an apartment, which was like a condominium, but which was not the usual thing in Vienna. Usually people rent the apartment. And it was a very beautiful big apartment in the outskirts of Vienna, in a very nice, nice section. And um, so we moved out there, and my mother worked, my mother had a business, actually, she always was a businesswoman, even when we were very little. We had nannies to bring us up. She would be home in the afternoon and there, or the evening. But, um, you know, she, she worked, she always worked. She was at that time already a feminist, believe it or not. And you know Grandma, she, she knew how to order food. She was a feminist. <laughs> but she owned a store that uh, was, uh, it was not just, it wasn't crafts, it was only uh, like, uh, you know what it was. Needlepoint. Needle point and petty point and, and embroidery on, and you know years ago anybody that got married got a true soul that's the truth everybody did at least everybody I know and everything was always initialed so your tablecloths were initialed and your your, your pillowcases and your sheets and your uh, blanket covers and and your your slips anything anything that you own were finished she you know, they do things like that. And I was in a very big, uh, um, in a business district, some kids or whatever. Anyway, she was gone all day, and we were home. Somehow or other, we had a housekeeper. And by that time, as I said, we were about 10 and 12, so we were ready to go into um, something like, um, high, not high school, uh, elementary school. Elementary school, maybe more. More than elementary school, like in the fifth grade or something, was it? Well, it's something I think that, what would you call it, actually? Middle school, maybe. Middle school now. And where you go when you're 10 years old, in your fifth grade. And in that particular school, it was very interesting. Don't, no, no, you don't care that. You have to order that from Chet. You can see little advertisement from Chet. <laughs> <laughs> For Christmas presents. So you cannot have that. Absolutely not. But, um, I don't know, what was I saying? Where you lived. I said, well, and that I said, they went to school. Mm -hmm. So that particular school, there were all kinds of, there were all kinds of, of course, schools in Vienna, it's a big city. But this particular school 
was in the neighborhood where we had lived before when we lived in that hotel. And I thought it was a very good, they used to call it humanistic school, and I think the name is now sort of getting popular here too, which means that you, that you were more, um, just not specialized, but you put more importance on languages and history and you know, liberal arts and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah, but it wasn't college, it was high school. That was high school. Everything okay? Perfect. And um, anyway, the, this school had boys and girls, but they were closing the school to girls. We said, we don't want girls anymore, we just had boys. So my father, who was very energetic, and who took very good care of the kids, even though they were divorced, there was no problem there, we all loved each other. He went to school and made a great big fuss and said, my daughter has to go to this school because my son goes to the school, and we had to, that was like a heaven out of my home, this particular school, because it was such a good school. But he said, um, so my daughter has to go here too, because she cannot go by herself. So sure enough, they really let me go to the school, which means that we were the last class with girls. So as we grew a little bit older, like when we were 13 years old or 14 years old, we were less and less girls. And it, they were never that it didn't mind that at all. There were just a few girls in school and hundreds of boys. <laughs> The, the school was, you had to take, we had to walk about 10 minutes, and then you had to take a trolley car, and then you had to change, take another trolley car, <coughs> and walk another five minutes. But um, we didn't seem to mind. I, I had a good time in school, and I think Freddie too. And um, somehow or other, we, we ended up, I don't know, he took some other subject or whatever it was. So then this extra subject took extra time. So somehow or other, we ended up in the same class for a couple of years. Because, as I said, he had to take this, you know, he didn't have to. He took extra subject for, because he wanted to. And uh, it was very, very funny because we didn't really walk together. We would go and run to the trolley car, catch the next one, so we wouldn't be late. But sometimes I would come to school, and I would know if Fred would come to school or not. Because sometimes he played what you call the hooky, which is a very funny game, which all kids in all, land, in all countries like to play. They make believe they go to school, but they don't go to school. So the teacher would say to me, where's your brother? When is he coming? And I said, I don't know. Then the teacher would say, don't you live in the same in the same house? How come you don't know? Anyway, this is just saying a few secrets. But we were both good students, and we did well. We had to, in there, when we went to school, we went from 8 o'clock in the morning until, until about 1. Six days a week, not five days a week. And um, then you were home. Usually, if you wanted to have some sort of a elective subject, like another language or something, or, or sometimes, like, um, there was no baseball, but there was soccer, of course, any kind of sport, then you didn't get home to do or so, but then you were done. And so, and the, the, the main meal, in, still is, but not that much anymore, but years ago, the main meal was at no time. Now, most, most stores closed for an hour or two, so people could go home, no, that's the way it was, you see, no, no, they took it easy. And, um, and the restaurants were open, of course. Neither you went home or yes, you went to a restaurant. In school, when you started at 8 o'clock, by about 10 o'clock you got a break. Like you said, today your kid, kids get break in school. Mm -hmm. And they sold just as they do here. Little sausages and little sandwiches and stuff like that. And, but you had to go outside, you couldn't do that in your room. You had to go in the courtyard and get some fresh air. That was the requirement. And then when you got home, you had to be meal. And in the afternoon, you either did your homework. And people did you do homework in those days. The schools in, 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 in Austria, or I think all over all Europe, probably, you're not supposed to shoot them. The schools were geared on learning, for learning, to learning, I don't know. I said it wrong, I think. Because um, there wasn't such a thing as, you weren't supposed to learn social graces, you know, very much for the, for the system where you learn something in school instead of just kind of figuring it out. Like, for instance, there was no junior Red Cross, and there was no, um, you know, nobody was the president of this club and that club. I mean, this time was really spent in teaching and learning, and when you got out of there, when you got out of that school, which was eight years, first of all, you really didn't flunk that easily. If you didn't do very well in one or two subjects, then you could take it over the fall, which I think is a good idea. Sometimes the kid fools around a little bit. And that should cost them a whole year in school, you know. But anyway, that's what they did. And then they got out. When you, when you finished your eight years of high school, it was called gymnasium. It's 
doesn't mean that much, but anyway, there are different types of schools, okay? One was humanistic, that means when you finish that particular type of school, you could go in, into law school or medical school, and you not much else, actually. Um, yeah, you could study philology, which means languages. Or else you could go to one where water, you know, bands. And that was um, like, um, you also learn a lot about uh, uh, drawing and drafting and stuff like that. So you could also become an engineer if you want to. And then there were some schools where you could only, it was only geared to just become an engineer or something like that. And then when you graduated from there, it was the equivalent to four years of college in America. And that is the truth. I mean, you went, went immediately from, from an eight-year-old high school into a professional school. And all these students that came from overseas, especially from medical school, with lots of American students, they were not one bit advanced over the, over the Viennese students because, as I said, I mean, there's a lot of things, a lot of time spent in this country, even now, even with being wonderful with computers and everything else, there's a lot of time spent in things that, in my opinion, don't belong to, don't belong to school. They can learn them at home, but don't learn them at all. They're late and they're like social and that, you know. mm -hmm. So what else do you want to know? Okay, so, that, so then after that, and so we, we lived in this very nice place, in, in it's, it's called Dürbe, in a very nice suburb of Vienna. It belongs to Vienna. And what the, and you know, in the afternoon, people that age, they would, you know, I don't know what I did. In the winter time, I went skating. There were ice skating places, public ones all over the place. And there were swimming pools in the summertime. And I uh, met your friends, I guess. Um, and and uh, the same as in this in this country. Years ago, kids did get into trouble. There certainly were no drugs or something like that. And I don't know anybody that drank. Maybe people did drink, but I, mean, I don't think kids drank. I, I didn't know. Probably kids smoked, probably. I mean, I didn't. I was a pretty good. I didn't drink or uh, smoke, and I don't think Fred did. At least I didn't know anything about it. And in the summertime, we usually went on vacations with family we were very good with our parents. Or the husbands, in the, the husbands who, most of the fathers and husbands didn't go away for the whole summer. They went and come to some place, like maybe to Italy or Yugoslavia or in Austria, some place in the mountains, rented a house for their wife and their kids. And then they would come out maybe once a month for a weekend. And which I'm sure I'm sure there was a lot of problem there are a lot of problems there because the husbands were left alone all the time and husbands should be left alone. <laughs> but but that was the custom it did for me. And we were middle class. We were definitely not rich, we were surely not poor. We were just an average middle class family. But that's what happened. Sometimes we went someplace or other usually was my mother. And then my father would just come in between. And the rest of the time, they each did what they wanted because they were some husbands. It's not a good idea. I wouldn't recommend <laughs> well, that. Where did you go to college then? Well, I went mean, to college. The college is a totally different situation than here. And I think it still is. That you go, in your, generally speaking, in your, own, in your own city. Something like in Canada. People live in Montreal, go to Montreal to school. People that live in Toronto, go in Toronto to school. There are kinds of colleges. But you come home in the evening, there's no, there are no dorms and stuff like that. So it has advantages and disadvantages. Again, it's maybe a little bit less fun for the kids, but they learn more, they get done faster. And they can really have the fun later. I mean, I didn't think ever that I didn't have any fun. You had fun too. I mean, there were dances and parties and stuff. And as far as that goes, the kids never worked. There were no jobs for kids. Kids meaning under 16 or 18. There wasn't such a thing. I think there was enough unemployment in those days that grown-ups got those jobs, like, you know, cleaning things or babysitting or something like that. Babysitting, the mothers were home. Who needed babysitters? Well, in my case, we had a nanny. But generally speaking, it was not a babysitter. It was a person who took care of everything. So I hadn't even thought about that for years and years. But I did have a job, and I was in, and I was in the last couple of years in high school. Oh, no, I think the first two years in law school. I went to law school, so that was downtown in Vienna, so all I had to do was take a trolley car. Nobody obviously had a car. But even though, you know, when we were very young, my father at that time made more money. He was an entrepreneur, you know, he owned coffee houses or factories or this and that, then he sold it did something else. That's that's what he did. But um, so when we were very little, in our first few years in school, we went to a private school, and we even had a car and a chauffeur, believe it or not. But that didn't last long. I think that lasted 
Krishna. He was my son. The question wasn't as bad as it was here, at least I don't think so. I mean, not as bad for sure. He came gradually, like, he didn't come just overnight, like in 29 people are, you know. Some people supposedly jumped out of the window and committed suicide. But they were mostly people who had about a lot of stocks on, uh, I don't know what you call it, a margin, I think they call it. In other words, they bought a lot of stock in bond, hold it. Well, if you have a lesson, a sad lesson, but you can't do that. The people that have an ordinary job, most of them can't have them. But I don't remember that it was like that when I was very young. So, well, that's about it. Then, then you went to, to law school? And my daddy went to? He went to medical school. Fred went to medical school. And he, uh, he and his friend Kurt, our home you met, and his, that person's brother aunts, they all went to medical school. And of course, I, 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 I medical school is a year longer, I think, than law school. I think it's five years. But mm -hmm. uh, law school was four years. So I graduated from law school. I got all the requirements, you know, the four years and signed and everything else. But I did not pass the bar exams. Those should pass like here, remember? John, John Kennedy missed, I think, two, three, four times, whatever. But I mean, there, you take those out for you, did all your study. So I didn't do that because Hitler came and I'm 38. That's when I graduated. So then I wasn't allowed to go to university anymore. And so I thought I could go and get my books. So then I got my, my books, my matriculation. You know what matriculation is? So it's funny, but some people don't know that. Anyway, so I happened to have that, you know. Not that it makes the balance of difference, but anyway, so. So I, I did graduate from law school, but it doesn't really make any kind of difference. And then hit at 38, across the street from me, by that time we had moved, my mother and, and Fred and I moved to a more downtown, in a nice apartment, downtown, that, and it was very close to the university. And um, I, just to show you this situation at that particular time, there was a kid, a guy, living across the street from us, just across the street, no boyfriend whatsoever, just, just an acquaintance, a colleague, right? and he went to university also. I don't even remember if he studied law or not, but he went at the same time I went. Because you went in the morning, you came on the afternoon, or the evening, depending on what classes you had, but you didn't stay there all night. And I used to sometimes go with him here, and I remember because he had a little woman, he had a motorcycle, he said, sidecar, and it came me right, just so we left the war. The day after Hitler came, he didn't even say hello, he got out his SS uniform. He had been a, he had been a Nazi all these years without anybody knowing him. That's, you know, that's how. The Austrians were very, very sneaky. For a long time, they tried to make believe that they were victims of the Nazis. But they weren't. They were just as bad or worse, because they were sneaky. The Germans, at least, everybody knew they were Nazis. And the Austrians acted, you know, they, they were always very friendly and they're nice to strangers. And they, they'd say, kiss your hand, and, you know, and they like music, and, you know, like to see coffee houses, that sort of thing. But they, they were pretty rotten. <laughs> They were just as bad as any, any Nazi in any place in the world. And that this is just an example of somebody that is like your colleague, you think you know it, you know. And you didn't know it because you never knew what, uh, what was going on. You know, and the Nazi scam was pretty rough on anybody. So luckily, you know, Fred didn't get arrested and I didn't get arrested. But Walter got arrested. There was a day that was called the 10th of November. And here in this country we call it Crystal Night. I think the name supposedly uh, derives from the, from the idea that so many stores and houses and windows were smashed and there was a lot of crystal growing. I think that's what, but at that time that's not what it was called. It was just called Tens of November because at that time there was an organized, a pre-organized program all over Germany and Austria. I mean, it was really organized. And when, when Walter got to camp and your grandpa, when he went to, to Dachau, the both were in the same camp. I didn't know it was in the same place. But the art of that camp had already been made ready for it, you know. They knew that all these people had gone come. They just arrested people on the street, whoever they wanted to arrest them. Just just like that. And they just dragged them there. As a matter of fact, um, you know, your Aunt Walter, or whoever's coming to listen to the state what <laughs> he uh, he got up real early that morning, like at four o'clock in the morning. And he went to the American consulate, and um, because he had gotten his passport to come to America, and by mistake, because the, the sheer, sheer mistake, they uh, had left my name out of it, because we were married. Right? 
Then we got married in July of that year. And now that's another story. When we got married, we had to go back. We could only go two people together, two Jewish people together on the street. It was a third one in a resident room. So my own grandfather had to come back, Charlie Carr, himself, to go to the temple. We got them mad in the temple, but you just had to, just a few people could go. And then they came to my house, and uh, to our house, my mother's house, the apartment. You know, we had some, whatever, refreshments or something. But my father wasn't there because he was in Prague, Czechoslovakia, and the Fred had already gone to Prague too. So he was the baby. So I think Fred had come there a few months before that. That's another story too, I don't know where to and once you get started, you can start, because each one is a story. So, you know, it's a, this wedding was okay, whatever. And then, um, you know, Fred, Fred, Fred went to stay with my father, trying to, you know, keep out of being arrested and not being, you know, not being arrested. So, um, and he, he went someplace where the people, that's the way I remember, Fred might remember a little bit differently, you know, it's a long time. But the way I remember it is that he went, you know, you found out like here when the Mexicans cross near near San Diego the front right. they, they know where to go. I mean it's a terrible set. I mean, I know I'm totally against illegal immigration. I'm totally for immigration, but against legal illegal immigration. But then I saw a sign there near San Diego, you know, where you where a woman is carrying a baby and then a couple of dogs run after that and it says no crossing in cars. It's very sad. It's very, very sad. But it, this was this was something like it. There were some certain places where people, you know, by mouse, you know, people would tell each other that they thought you could go over there to Czechoslovakia over the border. And the, the strange thing was, which most people didn't know and certainly didn't understand now, that the Nazis really let you go. The, the soldiers there, the Nazi, you know, the soldiers, the Nazis, they would let you go. It's a big, big difference between soldiers and Nazis. Soldiers sometimes really had to do all those things. Nazis, that's uniform SS or, you know, they were the worst. But anyway, they let you go because they wanted to get rid of the Jews. But the Czechs would let you in, just like we don't let the Mexicans in. It's, it's totally different reasons, but it's the same idea. If you want to understand how the situation was. They were so, I know Fred, and he had met some fellow there, or maybe not before. The two of them tried to go together. And I think they were sent back two or three times. Finally, they made it. Probably the guards just went in another direction or something. Else. I really don't know exactly how. And then the way I remember it, then they hid in a haystack someplace. And in the morning, a farmer went by with a, with a truck, with a wagon, not a, not a truck, and gave them a ride to Prague. And once it was in Prague, which is the capital of Czechoslovakia, in a beautiful big city. Um, you know, they, they, of course, he went to, to my father, to, you know, to his father. And then, you know, at that particular day, it was over that time until he went to, until he went to England. You had to have a quota in order for us to get to America. You had to have a quota. Everybody had to have a quota. That means so and so many people were allowed to come to America from us. And it went by your birth place. If you were born in Poland, so and so many thousands of people were allowed to come come every year. If you were born in Bulgaria or Romania or in Austria, the people that came from the East Euro European countries like Romania and whatever I just mentioned, uh, there were always many more people that wanted to come to America because it was much worse for them. There were always problems. They were always under their sentence. It was always very bad for Jews in those countries. But it wasn't like that in Austria. I mean, no matter what people tried to tell me, I never had a problem. And so, you know, for, for at least a hundred years, people, Jewish people lived quite comfortably in, in Austria. Could do be a, could be professors, could be doctors, could be anything. There, there was no problem. So, uh, so, so the Austrian quarter was a little bit easier to fill because not that many had, people had wanted to go, you know, at, at that time. At that beginning of the year it goes by the year. So, so we, we didn't ignore anything about border war and I. But some young man once came by, we were someplace, and he said, well, I'm going to the American consulate to just to get a number so I might get informed. He said, what's that? So they, they registered us too. If it had been for him, we would have never gotten out. I don't even know what it was. But anyway, so we did have this border, and what they had gotten back from the concentration camp, luckily. And what happened is, the day that he got arrested, is he had gotten a letter from, from he had gotten his passport, but my name was not, like I mentioned that before. And um, so I went to the, and I was going to go there to rectify that. But early in the morning, about six or seven in the morning, 
Everybody knew, you know, people get up early in Europe because business starts at day. Everybody knew there was a big program going on. And if people don't know what a program is, that means that, you know, people are allowed to smash, hit, kill, do whatever they want to, as long as they are, as long as they were Nazis, as long as they were not Jewish, let's put it that way. Right? They could, and they, there was no, there was no policeman who told them to stop or anything like that. So, so we found out about that my mother died. And I went to, uh, I took a cab. I had a little bit of an advantage at that particular time because I was sort of normal looking. I was just a young girl, 22, and just normal. You know what I mean? I didn't look uh, what they call Aryan, with long brown hair and blue eyes and a stupid face. <laughs> but, but, but I also didn't look what people at that time called typically Jewish. I mean, I didn't have, you know, whatever they called, I just, you couldn't tell what I was. So I didn't have a big problem, you know, walking the street, generally speaking. And because if you did have a problem, believe me, they were so mean. What they used to do is just, the Nazis used to write on the, on the sidewalk, you know, Jew pig or something real bad, bad about Jews. And then they grabbed some real old Jewish people, they made them kneel down and wash it. Scrapped and then the other people would stand around and gee and say, ah, great, great one. I know. As long as you ask me and you want to have kind of a history of that, you might as well hear the bell too. Because I could tell you that the gardens are gorgeous, and only flowers, and music. <laughs> you know, you could do that too. It would be true. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> well, what I want to know is then, what year did you get married to Uncle Walter? In 1990. Uh, 38. See, Hitler came in March, and I got married in July. And then he went to the concentration camp on November 10th, and he came out in January. And, uh, and why he came out is because, being that I was young, just like you were still young, but you're not that young. But when you're 20, you're young, and you don't know anything, like your children now. They don't think anything can ever happen to them. So I went to all the hospitals and the jails, and, you know, tried to find out. And pretty soon we got letters. We got letters from the concentration camp. Because the Germans were so damn methodic, you know, they, 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 they take big pride in it, you know, that they do everything just according to the rules. And the rule was to, you know, either kill or arrest or whatever they choose. But once they were arrested, they even gave you a little chart in a little, a little box where you could put your change in and they let you go. If they let you go, they gave you back the change. They meant so ridiculous, right? But anyway, they, he would, I have a letter someplace where he wrote and it was a form letter. And he had to say, well, we're fine, and everything's fine, and right, you know, just a lot of alone, you know. But, but I did, and I went to the Gestapo a few times, that's the headquarters of the SS and stuff. For some reason or other, I wasn't scared, I don't know why not, I have no idea. Because they could have kept me there, of course. But somehow or other, they had found out that some are going to be released. Well, you had to have a ticket to go to America or any place, like my Andrew Richard went to South America. But if you had a place to go, see, if all the countries in the world, I'm not saying why they didn't do it, because they didn't care. We, we don't do that much about Bosnia either. But at that particular time, if the countries would have let the Jews in, nobody would have gotten killed. Hitler could have saved himself a lot of work. He didn't care to have those concentration camps and, and eliminate his people and burn them and kill them. I mean, that's the truth. I mean, he was, he was sort of rotten, 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 but he, didn't want to, he just wanted to get rid of the Jews. So if other countries would have let them in, they would have gotten killed, but nobody let them in. Just nobody. I mean, practically nobody. To, to England, you could get in if you had, if you had a certain, uh, uh, if you were requested by some family. The family wanted a gardener, or the family wanted a nanny, the family wanted something like that. Or if you went with a children's transport, then you could get, go to England. And English, they were plenty bad later with, with, with um, um, Palestine, and, you know, didn't get the promises or anything. And, I wouldn't say too many good things about the English in those particular times, Great Britain. But they did let people in when there was a certain, re you know, when, when, when there was a justification to get in. But in to America, you could only get in if you had that quota. Are you warm? Yeah, but just from the sun on me. I'm not warm. I'm just oh, the yeah. sun, you know, blowing right up my head. Okay. So. I thought maybe from what you did. Oh, no. But no. anyway, so, but I'm still I'm getting, I'm still getting, I can't. You, if your dad ever hears that, he'd get really mad at me. And if Uncle Walter listens to it in heaven someplace, he'd get mad too. Because I can't finish a story without getting sidetracked and start another story. And then I don't know where to start. But I don't know why I do that, but I do it. But, but anyway, so I got, we got this letter that, you know, that 
to be legislated that brought it back to the American Council to get to straighten it out. And in the meantime, we found out there was a program. So I took the care and, and went down, and we know where the American Council was. The next door, very next door to the American Council, just by coincidence, was a, was a Gestapo, not Gestapo, an SA. There's, there's the SS, they were called. I don't know, they were the elite, and then the ones that didn't have all the college degrees, they just as bad, they were called the brown shirts. They did the same thing, but they were under the SS. And they had their headquarters right next to the American consulate. And the American consulate, for some reason, which of course I'll never find out, it's 50, way over 50 years, 60 years ago, and anyway, nobody could ever find out. But for some reason or other, the American people, the American government, sent people to be working in the council as, as councils and, and as secretaries and stuff like that in the American Council, they were the worst anti-Semites in the world. They didn't have one bit. They knew, they knew from five, four o'clock in the morning that there was a program going on. Everybody got arrested, and they didn't let anybody come in that place until eight o'clock in the morning. They just let them stand outside being beaten up. So I was my my, my cab, you know, the driver stopped the car in the corner, and one of those brown beasts came up. He said, "Riding bitch, you know." pants and then uh, riding a whip in sticking him out the door. And they walked all the way over there where people were standing in line for hours to get into the council. But they wouldn't open the doors and just beat them up. Beat them up. And then Matt kept there and said, let's, let's go, let's go, let's get out of here. I mean, he was just having to be nice. I mean, he couldn't just say you belong there too. But there was one woman, you know, like, um, like Roxy, um, um, somebody that takes care of a whole apartment house. Like a super, right? It's called a super. It's a perfectly respectable job here. You get a job like that, and generally speaking, you get your apartment either free or much cheaper, and you have to collect rent sometime. But that was a very low, 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 low job. I mean, it was just, I mean, it wasn't too much. I don't want to, well, it wasn't. Well, very nice people had jobs like that, or, or intelligent or something like that. So one of these women came out of, stood outside across the street and could watch this whole thing. And she had her hands like, you know, standing like that. No, no, I don't say that. Anyway, she was just enjoying it so much. And she laughed and she laughed. Oh, they should have done that sooner. I'll never forget that. And I hope she died a long time. I miss her I hope the American bombs hit her or something like that. And probably did, because sometimes there's a little justice. Not much, but once in a while there is. But anyway, that's when Walter got the rest of them and they came out. Then they came out, uh, or we were married, of course, already. He came out and then we left a month later and we started, um, Fred was already in Czechoslovakia. And we, 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 we went to Czechoslovakia first of all, and I, you know, to say goodbye to my father. We stayed there for 10 days. And, um, and when Walter left the concentration camp, of course he, he was called to the Gestapo and he had to swear that he would never talk about it or else he'd go right back. And, but of course people had given him names and addresses to visit him tell them that they were still alive. And so I went to sing to a few people and it was terribly sad, especially one lady, because she didn't know, she had a ticket for her son to go to somewhere, but she didn't know. She, see, that they, in, in Vienna, here too I tell you the truth, unfortunately, but much more in Vienna. I mean, everybody thought our Jews were rich, which is of course so ridiculous, you know. They put, they put Jews and the rich Jews and the good Jews and bad Jews and just like anybody else, right? Black and white and Jews, no, who knows what. But, but anyway, this lady couldn't help her son because she didn't know what to do. So it, it was, it, that was really bad. Anyway, we stayed in, in Prague for 10 days, out of which half, half a week I, was, I had flu because I was in you know, and stuff like that. Then we had to sign papers. We had to sign papers when we left Vienna. We had to pay some sort of big tax. We called it the exit tax, so they don't ask me what for. But we were allowed to bring our clothes and our dishes. Somehow at that time you could, not you could play, you could send them. But we had to pay for the crew, and I don't know how it was. But we had to sign papers that we would never touch German soil again, like if anybody would want to, but would have wanted to. But, but on the other hand, that way we couldn't take a train from Prague to Holland. We, we had to fly, which, which is okay, of course, but that was the first time I flew. And I had a brand new coat that my father had made for me. He was lined with fur, and no, oh, I know feel bad that they used fur, but in those days I wasn't smart enough. I would not use fur anymore, ever. But in those days it was nice and warm and nice, you know, tweed coat with fur lining and stuff, and, and boots with fur lining. But um, 
<laughs> then we went to the, the plane was where it was probably only a couple of hours, probably a TV plane, you know, that's a long time ago. And then when we went to Holland, we, but that's nothing about your dad. I, I want to know about that, well then you got, where'd you go from Holland? Okay, when we went to Holland, we, we, we arrived in Rotterdam, but we, or the other way around, we arrived in Amsterdam. And then we, but the boat left two days later, three days later from Rotterdam. But everybody went, went there two days earlier because we didn't want to miss the boat. So we had to take a trolley car to the house where we were assigned by a Jewish relief organization. And of course, naturally from the plane and from the from, from, I, I got good and sick of my new coat. Ah. <laughs> but it could get clean. And we came to this, obviously, I mean, I know now, but, you know, any kind of organization that helps. We get volunteers to look, but I think she got paid for expenses, I'm sure. And uh, quite an older Jewish lady who took in five refugees for, you know, two days here, two days there. But they were so nice about it. I mean, she could have just, you know, thrown the food at us. But it was always set on a nice, like my, my patio is here. And like the summer room, this white tablecloth and flower. Yeah, real nice. And uh, so we were about five or six in the particular house. We stayed two days. And first something funny happened because she, she was very sweet to us. And she said, well, you must be hungry. Why don't you just simply clean up and then come on down to this, in this room and we'll have some coffee with in Menirche. I know, I tell you what it means, in Menirche. And I didn't know what the word Menirche meant. I mean, I mean, she didn't say in Menirche, and Menirche. We'll have some coffee and Menirche. So we thought, of course, it's probably going to be some good cake or something, you know. But all we did is get coffee. And we were in hungry. Menirche, I found out later, was a Jewish word for rest in peace. So she was, <laughs> so we didn't get any food. So Walter just simply stole it, and he gave it back later. But he kind of took a knife. And the poor lady, she was kosher, you know. Maybe if somebody else listens, doesn't know what kosher means. You can't use a knife that you use for meat, and for cheese and stuff, too. But we really didn't care, we were hungry. So we took that knife, and my father, thing was a whole salami to take it off. So we ate that instead of that word that meant peace, and I thought it was meant, meant cake. It was kind of funny. Yeah. They got yeah. big food. And then the, next, the next day we went on a boat. We went on a very nice boat. And that's kind of a little story to that too, because we, we had to pay everything in advance, of course, because we all bought that $10 and that $10. We were allowed to take our own personal personal belongings at $10 each when we came to America. But we could pay for the ticket ahead of that. So we paid everything, including tips and whatever. And when we got on the boat, the second day, of course, the waiters knew that already, that these people are not going to tip a lot, because that we tipped, you know, as much as the tip was supposed to be, but that we wouldn't have an extra tip. So when they get very fresh, you know, and not bringing the things fast enough, so we caught under that the first day, and we paid them back, because we ordered every single thing on the menu. Like if it were, if there was soup or this, we ordered both, you know, even if we didn't eat it, because that was pretty mean of them, you know. They had a job, mm -hmm. and they, they were Dutch, and then their, their government paid them and things like that, you know. So, and then when we came to America, we, um, when we came to America, we, we had this very good, very dear friends, who he studied Vienna, medicine in Vienna for four, his wife in Vienna for four years, and we all became good friends, and he brought his wife over there too. Now, the reason why he studied in Vienna is, which is very sad, and I mean, I love this country to pieces. I would never want to live in any other place. But at that time, because there was a quota in America, and only so and so many Jewish people could go to college or could go to medical school, it wasn't exactly advertised. Most people didn't know about it. But that's what it was. So he went to Europe to, you know, first of all, he got accepted, second of all, it was cheaper. So he lived there for four years, and there they had a girl there, and we were very good friends. And they, you know, had guaranteed for us, and their friends had guaranteed for us. Because you have to have an affidavit. Somebody has to guarantee which people should do now when other nationalists come in. That if they, you know, that they guarantee for you, for, if I forgot how many years, I forgot that. But I mean, you could not be a burden to the state or to anybody. So, you know, that's how it should be. But hopefully sometimes it will be the biggest problem. The biggest problem, so. But anyway, so um, um, we stayed with them, I think, for one week. That's the only one week that we got something free. And we didn't want anything free. But we, you know, that for sure we wanted to be on our, our own two feet. And he was a very wonderful guy. He was a doctor at that time, just like Walter was a doctor. Right? But of course, he didn't make any money. It's not like now. You know, when a doctor now starts out, the, the hospital gives him an office and the 
band instruments and he yelled at him and an income. No, he, he, he didn't make nothing. So he, his mother lived with him, his mother and his wife, and then he had this one little girl. And so that she would go to buy, you know, four roads in the morning. So they had nothing there. So we, we stayed this very short time, but he was very nice and very smart. He sat down with work and he said, look, you can, you can just kind of hang around like other people do and get money from relief organizations, or you can go and start doing something, right? And so I gave him a plan of New York City. It's all the sub subway system, and they said, you take this one and this one and that one, and then you come to this particular street, and then you get on. And that's exactly, I mean, I couldn't have done it. The water did exactly that. And then he told him, because we had to go to this relief organization just once. But I had, you know, when, when Hitler came, when Hitler came, you know, over that, you know, like now when people lose so many jobs, we said, uh, what they call it, downsizing. And that usually some schools, some courses springing up that teach you something else. You know, re, what do they call it? Re, uh, Re uh, rehabilitation. No, not rehabilitation. Just teach them another, oh. you know, something else. Like if you're a teacher, you can't get a job as a teacher, but just fine. Not you, God forbid, but anybody else. Then maybe they'll teach you how to be a hairdresser or something like that. You know? That's exactly so. I took a course by the day. Not a hairdresser, but many things that I can't even do my own name. But I also took a course in making hand, handmade gloves, like out of leather. And, uh, and, you know, they really taught you how to do that. So this was the second day, the third day in this country. The second day my friend Cecile went to a women's and professional club meeting, which I'd never been to a meeting like that before in Europe. They didn't have club, they didn't have club mother clubs and stuff like that. They just didn't. And all the girls, so-called girls, they were all like 40, 50 years old, and I was like 20. And they are, my sister was younger, but most of them, they had like pink dresses on and yellow hats and curls and they called each other girls. And I wasn't used to that, I'm not making fun of it. But I wasn't used to that, I called everybody by their last name. You know. Anyway, the, I was the program. And I know that that is that, that was very good for her because in the meantime I've worked with a lot of organizations and that's one thing you always need, is a program. <laughs> and so there, there was this girl in this country two days and she was already trying to sell something. So she, so this, this ladies looked at my gloves and they gave me some orders. So the next day, which was the third day in this country, Walt and I went downtown. And there's a street in New York City, and I think it's 34th Street. I'm not sure, one cross street, you know, that goes cross Fifth Avenue and all the avenues, but it, it's a number. So either 33rd, 34, something like that. And they were all, that's how it is in New York City. They have maybe all, in one, in one street, there's all the old jewels, and another one, there are this. So in this particular street, there were all leather stores. So I walked, I had the nerve, I had the guts, or the chutzpah actually, to walk in this store. See, I could speak English, not very well, you know. I've learned a little in the meantime, but... A <laughs> little? You speak beautiful English. But, but one, yeah, whatever, I mean, but I really could make myself understand. I mean, I've understood and I could make myself understand. Not on the telephone, but otherwise. But, uh, but Walter couldn't because he learned French in school. He went to a different type of school. So he had to learn everything here. He learned his English from nurses in the hospital. That was pretty bad. <laughs> pretty bad. And then he always made believe he didn't know what he was saying. But I went in the store and um, and you know, they said, you know, it was a wholesale store for leather. And I said, I need some leather to make gloves. So they said so they said, But why don't you buy gloves? You know, they thought I was crazy. I said, No, no, no. I said, I have to make gloves. I mean I want to make a living. So they so then of course they started asking me when I came and I said two days ago. So the other people Got to get, there's this green car. She's here two days and she wants to make a living already, you know. So they visited this me now. Anyway, so they sold me several pieces of skin that I wanted for leather, for gloves. And um, very cheap, they gave me everything wholesale or more. But I couldn't use it like that because in, in Austria, the leather was already what you call shaved. In other words, then you could, it was, it was soft and you could just do whatever you wanted with it. But this one had to be shaved. So I said, well, what will I do? So they said, well, on 5th Avenue, this was close to 5th Avenue, on this and this corner, it gave me the address and the name, upstairs, the sound building, there's a step, then we sent you. So again, I went, the water was with me, but I went upstairs by myself. So I went upstairs and told the guy what I wanted. And so, and you know, I just graduated from law school. He was going to law school too in the evening. So anyway, he, he did this whole thing for me free, he never touched me a penny. He shaved it and, you know, he was really, well, you know, he was just being very nice. But anyway, I started making gloves. And the thing is that they had to be delivered. So the first orders were from that 
from the club, you know. And I have a couple. Last year, brought some here just to show. I don't know who I was talking about. We may be embroidered them, bought them, did it too. We did, uh, maybe a pair of blue kid gloves, and on top we made maybe six little holes that they were embroidered in white and in red. They were, you know, they were nice, all beautiful. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful, you know. We charged three fifty for them. I know three fifty was like a lot of money now, but at Macy's they cost more. They were not handmade, you know. I mean, everybody who bought something from refugees made sure they got a good bar. I mean, it wasn't just to help the refugees, believe me, you know. But anyway, so these people were the clubs. And then I had this friend, you know, remember Kurtz, my friend, the baby? Okay. But his wife, his wife, I asked her if she can help me. I already employed two people. And she helped me and a friend of herself. So the, the glitter cost me a figure, one dollar, and I paid them. I gave one dollar to one of the girls that made the pair of gloves, and then I had one dollar, I had one dollar from proper up and almost, because you had to, you had to get yarn to and stuff like that. And I had I found the book, which is now here in, in Elizabeth, because I found it last year, and I'm going to look for it again now that we get into this ridiculous thing. Mm -hmm. Because I had almost a hundred customers already. I could have built up a business as well again. I could have. I should have stayed with it. I, I really could have. I mean, can you imagine handmade gloves? Because I'd have to charge more than 350 but which just the same. <laughs> but, but, but it didn't happen often, but two or three times it happened that somebody would write a letter saying that the thumb was a bit too thin, too wide or too long. What you had to go by subway to go and pick up the gloves. <laughs> they bring it back. For 350 yeah. But anyway, that was a good thing. But then Martha got a job. Oh yeah, the Martha went to this, um, Martha went to this, uh, it's kind of fun because I've forgotten all that. The Martha went to this relief organization, which I forgot what it was called. And they, you know what they told him? I didn't think they would do it now too. They said, that's ridiculous. There's so many doctors. Go find a job. Don't, don't go and try to make a doctor. Don't take a test. Don't try anything. You'll never make a living. There are too many doctors. So when he told that to his friend, Morris Arthur was our friend where we stayed for two weeks. Two weeks, I think it was two weeks at the most. Morris said, don't be ridiculous. You're a doctor, you're going to be a doctor. Forget them. Do it without them. Don't, don't, don't bother with them. So somehow I found out that there was a, there was a, some small hospital in Brooklyn was looking for interns. Mm -hmm. Is this thing still running? Oh, yeah. Okay, was looking for interns. And um, he got a job there. Now the job was totally free, not one single penny. He didn't get one penny. He slept four in one room, and each each intern had different number of rings. You know, like if it rang once, this one goes if it rang twice. But of course, they all woke up with every ring, so it was really miserable. It was miserable. But uh, while he worked there for only two or three weeks, he got a job in New Jersey where he stayed for two years. They got twenty-five dollars a month. And you know, it was quite a bit nice. And he stayed after after a year he got finally made fifty dollars a month, which was very little then too. I mean it was we were very happy to have, but it was very little. In the meantime I got a job through my friend's mother in law. Through my friend's mother, whatever. I got a job to be a nanny for two little boys. The name was Michael and Stephen Klein. They were very sweet, they were four and a half years old. I got along beautifully with them. They were very sweet and very nice. I started working there, I think, probably, when we got in February, in the end of February, two weeks, no, first, first we stayed with Scoot and Craig, our friends, they rented an apartment downtown on the Lancy Street, there was a movie a few years ago, Crossing Lancy, it was a totally Jewish neighborhood, poor Jewish neighborhood, and they had little push carts on the street, they sold things like, just from push carts, well, I didn't see, you know, the real sheep, right, and, and they got an apartment, in the third floor, Walker, and there were two rooms, two bedrooms, and, and so they rented us another room. They let us stay there. We had, we had a mattress, you know, one of those mattresses for the swimming pool, mm -hmm. but the heavier ones, the one that we had like canvas, because when my father, you know, as I told you, was divorced, in the last couple of years before Hitler came, he managed a hotel in a very beautiful resort place in Czechoslovakia, and I went to visit there. And we were married, I think, what we went to visit there. And uh, we used to, we bought this, this raft there, and we would go across the lake on it, you know. And we brought the raft along in our, in our box, you know. It was called a lift, whatever we brought. So we had this thing to sleep on. It was, of course, very small. And about two or three times during the night, he had to get up and blow it up. 
Was it? It was the light. They have or not? They have not. Yeah. I don't believe it didn't come here with love was great. But that time it was March already, and Hitler marched into, marched into Czechoslovakia, that's where my father was and where Fred was. Fred wasn't there anymore, thank God. He was already in, in, he was already in England. But my father was there, I'm sure Fred was in England then. I'm almost positive because I how else would have gotten there. But I'm not sure, but it was a very sad day. It was just about a year after Hitler came to Austria, March 14th or 15th, that he marched into marched into Czechoslovakia too. That was bad. But anyway, we, we stayed with them for, for only two or three weeks. And then I got a job staying with these people, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Klein. A very rich, new, rich new world, you know, new world rich, I should say, new world rich. And they acted like that. They were nice. They meant to be nice, but they just didn't know how to be really nice because they weren't brought up like that. They all of a sudden, he made money in the silk business. And they had this huge apartment on Central Park West, which is very expensive, believe me. It was like one block from Central Park, and they had me, a nanny. Then they had a, a maid, and they had a cook. Now, the cook was the husband of the maid. He worked in the cafeteria, but he fixed the evening meal, see? So they had all that. Now, the boys and I, Stephen and Mike and I, had one sort of like, almost like a little apartment. One play, one playroom, you know, and one bedroom. So I had to keep them clean and they had to iron their clothes. Now these children, and, and the mother would tell me what to do. Like, I mean, they had to take a nap. They're four and a half years old, they had to take a nap, which of course they didn't want to take. And of course, they had to be in bed at 6 o'clock at night, 6 30. And that means they woke up at 4 in the morning, and I didn't have my own room. I didn't even have a whole day off. I only had a half a day off on Sunday, and half a day off on some other time, whatever it was. But they were nice kids for them. They really, and I, you know, I did things like we did in Europe, and let them go to stores, and they corrected me when I said something wrong. I mean, one thing, I, I remember two things that I said wrong, for sure. One thing, somehow, I, it's, <laughs> it's pretty funny, but of course, for one happy old kids, they correct you. Right. Like, Jerry taught, Jerry taught Uncle Richard English, because Richard was reading, and Jerry, Jerry was only three and a half, and he, he would tell him what was right and wrong. <laughs> but, but anyway, one time I said, I meant to say suspenders, but I, I said suppository. <laughs> <laughs> and then another thing I said, I kept saying that long time, even Susie was little. Instead of orangutan, I would say orangutan, because that was the pronunciation of German. Right? Mm -hmm. So there were other, other things to show about that. But they were nice kids, but the, the mo most problem I had is that the person wouldn't sleep, and I wouldn't sleep, because they had to, you know. The parents never saw them, only Mrs. Klein would come, Supper time, and we had supper separately. After the bears, about six o'clock, they had the pajamas on, and then they cut the supper, and then half an hour later, you know, the mother came and visited with them, and then everything was done. But, I know, they, they, they thought they knew how to bring up kids. And on Sunday, on Sunday morning, the, the children went in the parents' bedroom, and then, uh, you know, after they dressed and all that, the father would take them to Central Park for a walk, and I was allowed, allowed to come along. And that was the only time the father paid attention to the children. It was strange. And I, of course, I was European, so no matter how cold or warm it was, they had to walk. And <laughs> they went for walk in the They were cold, but they put another scarf on. But they went to a nursery school, a fancy nursery school, three times a week for two hours. Guess what they wore to school there? Wax. Uh, do you know what Shantan is? Raw no. silk. Raw mm -hmm. silk. It's not silk that doesn't really look like silk. Mm -hmm. And it's really bothersome to have. And I, for better or for worse, I'd never had an iron in my hand. Because we always had a maid. And she had it. And she said, get away from me, you know. I didn't do it good. I went to school. And I, when I went to school, I tutored that. I had two little girls and two that Latin for two years. And, uh, you know, so I mean, I did something. But I certainly didn't iron. So she had to show me how to iron silk suits. You roll them in, you roll them and then you sprinkle them and roll them in a towel. And they had to be just right. And since that time, which is like, 55 years ago, I had iron. I will not iron. If I buy something that needs to be ironed, either I take it to the cleaner, or at home I have rules, right? Right. Yeah. But now that I'm here, either I take it to the cleaner, or I just don't wear it. I will not iron. So, <laughs> I think that happened from that time. Mm -hmm. That was a very nice, the lady who, the lady who um, was, was a maid there, was very nice. I explained to them that I needed an affidavit from, from a friend of mine. And they signed the affidavit, 
they made no money, just what they, you know, they were made, and, uh, and he, he worked in the cafeteria. And he sat there for day that they would take care of that lady when she came. She was a hairdresser. She was she had the same name as that in Miami. And she used to always take, do my mother's hair. And, and, and my mother I told her she tried to do something. And she came to this country. But Mr. Klein who made a lot of money. I told him to, to give me an affidavit for my father. And he, he said, I would really like to help him. I'll never forget it. He said, I would like to help, but I really couldn't, Danny, because then I'd have to give away all my financial records, and I can't do that. So my father died there. Yeah, he could have done that. Like this, he could have done it. But it would have been inconvenient. And they were Jewish, of course. But no couple had to try to help. But they told all their friends, oh, we are trying a refugee girl, you know. So, which meant that I got 50,000 months, which I was very happy with. Very happy and no complaints. But when we went to Central Park with the children, you let them play. And then you met all these other people there. And some were refugee people and they got 50 dollars. But the others said, we are refugees, got a hundred. See? But the people said that they were just dragging them. But then after that, when Walter was in New Jersey, he, he got me a job in New Jersey in the office of the Vime AHA. Yeah, I mean, he, he works in the association in the office. And so then I had to, you know, so then I came to see every which I'm very proud of because I remember that I think it did me a lot of good. Family that I got for, moved to far off of it for the summer. You know, like, it's, it's very, very, and other resorts, you know, like hotel, and the, and the husband stayed in New York, as they did in Europe and work. He came weekends only. And uh, it was very nice, and, you know, I guess we all went in the ocean. I can't remember exactly. I don't think there was a pool. But anyway, one time, he came out, and I don't know where the mother was, but he came out, and I was some, there too, there was a boardwalk, and, um, and a bench, and he was sitting down on the bench with the children. I was just having to stand there, could have sat down too, I don't, he didn't drink like a slave, he was nice to me. But just the same, guess what he did, he was eating an apple, and he put, when he was down with the apple, he said, yeah, and he put this in the basket basket. He handed me the apple that he chewed on. <laughs> And you know what? I'm so happy he did that. Even at that time, I was happy. Even at that time, I realized that I'm getting a wonderful education. How other people live and what they think of other people. <coughs> how other people feel. Really? This in our family. For years and years, even shortly before I died, he would still like, he would, would be eating some food or something. He said, yeah, and he put it in the waste for it. And joke with him. Of course, mm -hmm. because I mean, it didn't bother me anymore. I, I don't think it bothered me then. I, I immediately realized but that's just the way some people are. I mean, uh, you are, oh, wait a minute, I ate in the kitchen on Sunday. On Sunday when the children ate with their father and mother in the dining room, I ate in the kitchen with the men. And I had just graduated from Robert Rosberg, and Walter was in Johnny, they knew in another two, three years, he's going to make one, and you know, have status and stuff like that. They just didn't know how to be. They didn't mean to. They weren't, they weren't nice kind of thing. They just did not know you know, how a person should treat another person. And like, for instance, for Mother's Day, they got away from the whole day, but then Mother's Day they were home. And I bought some cards for them and flowers. And then I made the children memorize the card, you know, the rhymes. But they thought, yeah, they didn't realize that nobody does that in this country. But I didn't know that. Everybody memorized everything, you know. But they were pretty damn pleased when kids came to the bedroom door. Blah, 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 dear mother, blah, blah, you know. That's kind of cute. Mm -hmm. That's smart. That's what we do now at my school. Yeah. Memorization. That Constantly repeating and repeating. And how, how does anybody actually remember how much three times four is? Only by memorization. Why would three times? What's twelve? Twelve is just a number. It means nothing to me. But if you know, if you say over and over and over again, and uh, you know, finally they get back to that. But as far as you know, poems and stuff like that's concerned, that's when you remember it. Otherwise, how do you? Because you have to read it over, do it over, say it over. They were nice kids. I was often wondering, you know, they must be now 65 or something like that. But not approximately. Tell me about my dad and how my dad got here. How you come on? The dad got here. Okay, now when my mother came, okay, my, my niece mother, our mother, came and your grandma, came came to England first. Now, out of here. I, think, I don't think it comes from me. Tell that, that story. Because it's a long story too. Now, um, Arnold, you call him Grandpa. Okay, Grandpa. Okay, Grandpa, you know, and your dad just simply 
kind of a little tangent, but he wants you to remember that your grandpa's really his own father. But you only know one of them is grandpa. Okay, now grandpa worked for insurance company. Like he had a doctor's of law degree also, but he wasn't a lawyer. You know, he didn't, like he had too many people worked in insurance or real estate business and they graduated from law school. And he worked for a very big law insurance company that was called Anglo Elemental. And Anglo actually means English. So the headquarters were in London. And then the, the, the big company was in Vienna. And they all liked him. I mean, you know, he, he'd been working for years and years and years. You know, he was really very nice. And it's, it was very easy to like him. Mm -hmm. And he was intelligent and stuff like that. So uh, that is, unfortunately, he went to Dachau anyway. But his company, somebody from his company called him that morning and said, on the morning of November 10th, you know that night the program was, he, he said to him, now there's a terrible big program going on. Don't go home. Because they might arrest you. Just stay on the trolley car. Just drive around the trolley car. Because you used to have those cars for the trolley car that you could go and you know. I think you probably have it here too, I don't know. You got one a year or something. Anyway, so he actually stayed on the trolley car all day. And he didn't care. He was, you remember, he was a reader of this. He was fine. And also he liked horses. He was fine. He and cameras. Like, yeah. Huh? And cameras. There was like oh, yeah. pictures. Yeah, he loved, he loved. Yeah, but what he did is he liked horses and he would go to horse races with grandma. And, and then he would study the you know, that schedule, and they all think that they can make money that way, you know. Anyway, he was on the trolley car all day. He came home and was already dusk. Man. He wasn't, and the, the people from the Gestapo had come to my mother's house. I wasn't there. Well, I was probably looking for work at the time. And, and looked for him. And first of all, the woman again, that's another one, but the woman took care of our house. And when she got Christmas presents, she got, we were nice, we were friendly. But just the same, all she needed to tell to, to, to grab her one, but she didn't. She let it go right into the trap. So we had a very big apartment there. And it was like, I think what name was that? It's like um, just a few steps up from the, you know, it was not on the main floor. But so you could look into the windows if you wanted to. And, and it was all in one row windows because it was quite big. There must have been at least three bedrooms, I can't remember, and you know, you know, stuff like that, but it all in one row, right? And, um, and I think you know, you went to room, everybody turns off the lights. I mean, I think maybe your dad still does, and, uh, and Walter still does. I, I don't, I think it's kind of, I want it on, but Walter always turns them off. It's just, it's just you brought up like that, you never stop it, you know? And so she, but she kept all the lights on, thinking that he would notice that, you know? If he had looked, he would have noticed it. I mean, she would never have ordered that something like that. On the other hand, she kept them longer there. They would have left a long time ago. But there was a picture on the wall. The grandpa was in uniform, First World War, and she was trying to tell him, look, see, this is master. See, he was fighting for Austria. I mean, she thought she could get a better, better deal that way, you know? So she made it worse, because they really would have been gone otherwise. So he went, came home, after being on a trolley car riding on all day long, and reading the stupid schedule of the, of the horse, for the horse races, and didn't notice that. Then he walked in the house, and the woman was standing there, and never, she never said a word to him. She let him go right in, then he walked in the house. Yeah. So anyway, but, um, so, okay, so, they went, but on the other hand, when he did come out of, out of the concentration camp, not too much longer later than Walter. Because when Walter came, there were rumors that they're coming, we should all go to the railroad station. So I went to the railroad station every day. That was pretty sad. I'm not from Prague. You know, that would look different than actually. And then and, and we waited. Lots of people went there for, for two, three weeks or four weeks. I don't know what happened to the next one. And maybe they never came, but they didn't come. But anyway, others came, but maybe a couple of weeks later, I don't remember. And, um, and then he, his company from England requested his services, you see. So they requested the force if you got a request like that. So they were, that's how they got out. Otherwise, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to get out. So they got out and they stayed in England, I would say, in there. They were there when your, when your dad was there. Not all the time, but they were there at some time when your dad was there, I think. Not totally sure, but I think they were. I think grandma and grandpa came over first, because their code you know, came up, the number came up earlier. So they, they came to this country, and, and we, went, we lived in New Jersey then, and I. And we had a part in the, no, I had a room, not a room. I had just a French door. He lived in the hospital. 
Americans. And we, we got an apartment for them in New York City and we picked them off the boat. Oh, but that time we had a car. We got a car for $120 something, something like that. Ford. It wasn't even that old. And every, every 60 miles you had to put oil in. It was one of those cars, you know, that you could drive and then you'd put oil in. But it was still a great car. And anyway, so we picked them off the boat and we took them to the apartment. And almost immediately, and I, don't, I never found out exactly what she did. Grandma got a job in the factory, believe it or not. She actually worked in the factory. And Grandpa did something too. They both had a job right away. And, and, and maybe a week after we went to this country, Grandma told Dad, my, you know, Walter, that, um, she, that she had something real wrong. What she had was a fiber tumor. You know what a fiber tumor mm -hmm. Okay, but a very big one. She, you know, she, 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 she had no way otherwise to tell anyone. So she told Walter, and he took her to New Jersey to, to this, um, uh, uh, not an obstetrician, it's going to be an obstetrician, a gynecologist, a gynecologist. And we were friends with them. And he, then he said it's, it was a very big, big tumor, and it had to be cut right away. So they kept her right away there in the hospital after they'd only been in this country maybe two weeks. Kept her in the hospital and operated them. And, uh, and of course, the surgeon, Dr. Bjorka, may rest in peace, I'm just a such a good guy. He never charged a penny. Quite assisted, of course. The anesthetist didn't charge a penny. And you know what else? The hospital didn't charge. Uh, okay. They were human. In, in those days, people were human. Okay. You know what? There was a refugee in town or whatever. They had mm -hmm. no money, right? They just, but I mean, nobody would care now if you could die on the street, right? You just yeah. don't. There's not, there's not such a thing. Anymore. There is no such thing. But anyway, so she and I in the meantime worked at the Grime AJ. But they worked on Sunday and not on Saturday, you know. And uh, so uh, I had to collect money and stuff like that. It wasn't very interesting. But anyway, I had a job and made twenty dollars a week, which was a lot of money, you know. And I saved, of course. Eleven. What? How much did I save? I think eleven or twelve. I spent three fifty for a room. That's all. And then I ate in a in a drugstore. Well, sometimes I was invited. But when I wasn't invited, then I ate in a drugstore. For 35 cents you could get, you know, like the TV dinners? Mm -hmm. It was, of course, not frozen, but it was like, you know, a little piece of meat, a little potato and stuff. It was 35 cents. Wow. And then, and then for breakfast, for breakfast I suppose I had coffee and a roll, I don't know. But for, for lunch, I would, there were all kinds of sandwiches that were 15 and 20 cents. But the cream cheese sandwich was only 10 cents. So I had a cream cheese sandwich. And I walked to work, of course. I mean, there was a bus. But that's, I mean, it's no sense telling it anymore because nobody, the kids couldn't, they couldn't in, in their wildest imagination even think that somebody wants to not take a bus because they say, Madara, even Madara right. they don't want to say, for right. Madara, so, right? They just don't know. You can't blame them. There's, there's, there's no way that they can understand. But anyway, so I was working, I, I was working on Sunday, and Walter caught me, Walter caught me, told me, take a cab and come to the hospital. Now, why would I take a cab? I never even had looked at a cab. I mean, you know, who had money to take a cab? I didn't even take a bus. But I took a cab. And now, uh, that was on the tenth day of my mother's, grandma's operation. Now, you know, now this, they make you get up after a few hours. For that reason, because people used to get back cards and die, right? So anyway, the girl that brought the aid, that brought my mother the food, on the tray, had remembered by herself that she hadn't brought any glass of water. So she went back to the kitchen, got the glass of water. By the time she came back to the room, my mother was out. She had a lot there. So if she hadn't come with that water, she would have been dead. Mm -hmm. So, but she, you know, called for help. And then she was in the hospital for six weeks. For six weeks. Now this doctor, Bill Carter, that I said, he didn't charge anything. He took money out of his pocket and paid, paid nurses. That's wonderful, I think. <laughs> okay, okay, I'll talk. <laughs> but there's so many good people, too. That's the good part. <laughs> and look at maybe over there. Anyway, after that, she went, she went, we were very, very friendly with the family there. He was a rabbi. And of course, he knew Walter real well because he got operated on right. The, the week Walter started working in this hospital, this rabbi wise got operated on. And so, and he did. You know, he spoke, spoke English, but he, he'd rather spoke German. So he was Hungarian. So he, he became very friendly with the family. They were very sweet. I mean, they got mad when we didn't come on a Friday night to eat. 
you know, we were just like, you know, over the years we were just very, very, very good friends. But anyway, so my mother, after this, after six weeks, she had to go someplace. So they got her a room somewhere. I mean, we paid for it, but they got a room. We bought the paid meant back to the nurses. Then they got paid for the end of the month. Because I'm sure nurses didn't get paid much. But, but, but anyway, uh, my mother got a room with, with just with a, with a person who wanted to rent out the room. And then this lady, the rabbi's wife, sent food over everything. But and the, the lady was so funny that the lady where my mother rented the room from, my mother and, and grandpa, um, spoke real, you know, this New York Jewish, you know, like, I mean, she spoke English, but this is a real accent, you know. I mean, so, and she, like, she called my mother Mrs. Boyger. She didn't say Mrs. Burger, she said Mrs. Boyger. And my mother learned a few English words here and there, you know. She had actually taken some English lessons in Vienna. She can, she, she had come could understand, could understand. But <laughs> my mother would say, if it rains outside, now the word for rain, the, ra the word for raining is to, to uh, almost the same as rain. But the word for raining real hard is this shit, it's like a next shit, you know? <laughs> and because it's the same word as like pouring, that's it, it's like pouring. The word for pouring is there. So my mother would say, oh, it's like instead of pouring out that you know, shit. It's shit, you know, <laughs> and the lady would say, Mrs. Boyger, please don't say shit. He <laughs> <laughs> was so funny. But in the meantime, Grandpa, in the meantime, Grandpa had a, had a colleague that worked in that insurance company in, in Vienna also. And this one, I forgot his name, and not that it matters. But anyway, this particular man had relatives in Mobile, Alabama. And that's how come they were, and they, he said, come down here, you can get a job immediately. You know, any kind of an office job or something, you know. And so he did, and he did get a job in a lumber mill in the office, like an accountant or something like that. And of course, grandma didn't work. And then, then, then now, you, you, grandma, your mommy said some other story the other day. Now, there's always a possibility that I forgot something, or it's a possibility that your dad did, because your dad has very slim memory of those things. He says he tried to block things out. But the way I remember it, it doesn't have to be the same exact, but it doesn't make a difference. In the meantime, we had come to to new fame, and I'm not going to tell you how because that really takes too long. You've got to give it a break. Yeah. Um, so anyway, in the meantime, we were in new fame already, but just a few days. So it's so hard to finish one story without the other, because when we came to new fame on the on the fifth on the on the fifth of January, which was our brother's birthday, we had an accident, and uh, it was icy. We had an accident, turned the car over on our roof, and uh, and looked like it was smashed out of the window. I was the one that wasn't that upset, just like I need that accident. I don't go to pieces in really bad situations. Maybe afterwards, but not at the time. But that was so, you know, he said, oh my God, you know. And I just wrote the window down and he cried out of the window. And there were some troopers coming already. And the day before, somebody had gotten killed on the same girl. It was icy. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful winter day, but it was icy. So we had to stay overnight in this particular little town. And the terrible, terrible hotel. Hotel. The hotel only had doors that were half closed, and I didn't know what it meant. But maybe that means something to you. So people, well, people don't usually stay all night, and people keep track. Oh, kind of hotel. Quick, quick hotels. Well, whatever. With prostitutes, right? Yes, something like that. Only they look like for him. And then we didn't get hurt at all. So, um, so, so the next day, there was a. It was was it a view? An always one. It was an always. It just bought an always one. A used one, of course. We had just bought noise, but we sold, we were going to sell the car to your dad, but when he got married, we said that's his wedding present. It was like probably 100 bucks or something. I don't know. I wouldn't swear to that, but probably, you know, or less. But, but anyway, when it, when it was a good car, we just had to put the oil in, you know. But, but, but anyway, so we, uh, we, uh, we had bought this other car, and there was an automobile agency in that little town. So they somehow did something that we could go on. So we came to Mufay, and we had decided on Mufay before, but that's a really long story. But I don't know, what, what are we talking about? Our friend, our friend went to Mobile, okay. But our man, how we came to Mufay, I'm going to leave that out. But we were in Mufay, and when we were in Mufay, okay, 10 days, Walter noticed that he had, you know, very large testicle. And in those days, I didn't even know the word for testicle. It's the truth, so it's very bad. But anyway, so, and, I, and he went, and he had met um, urologists when he was still in 
from Jersey, and the urologist said that when you, oh, you put a buffalo, you know, that's one of my, my pupils, is that this urologist had come from Mexico to operate on one of the doctors in New Jersey. And he said, well, if, so if you ever meet him, you know, make sure you say, look, so I can get in touch with this guy. Yeah, that we went off in 10 days. We got in touch with it. That's the truth, I swear to God. And so, what events to Buffalo to have look at that? He says, no way, do you go? So he had cancer for testing, and I was totally alone. That's right. I didn't know anybody. I didn't know one person, postmaster downstairs. His name was Tom Benton. But otherwise, I didn't know anybody. I don't feel sorry for myself, but I didn't know anybody. And there were mice and cockroaches. There was one mice in a, in a baseball basket one night. But somehow or other, you know, the new thing or anything like that. And I, one time I, yeah, it was 10 days afterward that, actually, I think it was three weeks. 10 days after, 10 days he opened the office, enough on the 25th of January he got up there. But he had the office open, open already. And so he had had a couple of patients already, for $1.50 in the office. Now. And uh, so, he called me on the telephone. He said, if someone comes to tell him, he'll be back on the service. Anyway, I went to Buffalo to see him. I had to take a bus from Newfane to Lacqua, from Lacqua to Buffalo, and from Buffalo to whatever hospital he was in. And generally something like this car. And then when I came back, when I came to Lacqua, there were no more buses from back. This was in general. There was a lot of snow in the road. And um, what was I supposed to do? Guess what? I took a cab. I took a cab from Lacqua to Nufe. And I think it took me like six months to tell what about it. It cost me seven dollars. <laughs> seven dollars. But anyway, very soon after that, Walter came home. As soon as he, you know, as soon as he could, I don't know, he drove home. Stitches in the drove home. And then he got radiation. I forgot how far, how many weeks. And he went in every day by himself and stopped inside of the road and threw up and was sick. I mean, he didn't know anyone. You either do it or you don't do it. But generally speaking, you don't have to do it. I mean, you either live or you don't. That's how it is to it. But Fred, in the meantime, had come to New Jersey, right? And he stayed with my mother because she lived in New Jersey at that time after the operation that they gave up the apartment in New York. And Fred had come very soon after that. And I know that we picked him off the boat. I know that for sure. So but what your mom remembers is not, it's impossible. Because he was in New Jersey when he first came out of the and because we picked him off the boat and we took him to New Jersey because my mother was still in the hospital. And then he said, sir, somehow or other. And right after that, well, during that time, he got a job with a friend of the rabbis in a, in a kosher little inn right on the, on the seashore in the Red Bank, New Jersey. Very nice. I mean, I've never been there. But I mean, just one of those little places where people go in the summertime or any time. But by that time, it was summer. How could it have been summer, spring, or spring or something, something like that. And they go with the children for your weekends or something like that. And he was a busboy. Now he had a little place to sleep, like, like a closet or something, not a room or anything. Not even a den, but just a place to sleep. And of course he got food, but he got no money whatsoever. None. And these people would come and they did give him tips. But you know, nowadays, when you were a waitress, when you were in college, right, yeah. when you were at the country club, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, my kids were in waiters, but I know that now the waiter has to share. I mean, so and so much goes to the head waiter, and so and so much goes to everyone, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there is a system now. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but at that, those days there wasn't. So if you didn't give it to the bus boy, you didn't get anything. And so they, they were not everybody, but there were quite a few who would say, well, I'll pay you the end of the week before we leave, and they just never, never paid. So he got very, very little money. In the meantime, the, there was a niece there, and she fell in love with you is your dad, and the, and the people that owned it was an older couple, I understand, that was their niece, you know. And then they just said, Fred, look, I said, why don't you stay here and marry her? And he says, we don't have anyone else, she's the only relative we have. You can have this, you know, when we die, be yours. And of course, they would have given a long time, but whatever. And he got so scared, he left the thing within two days after that. And he came up at that time, what was operating already, and he came up to see us. He was going to, to clean his grammar. Um, but he came to see us and he might have stayed a week or two, I'm not totally sure. But while he was there, there's a very funny thing. See, we lived upstairs. Somehow or other we had got this apartment fixed up, and that's a long story, so I won't go into it. But upstairs in this house, it was sort of an apartment. It was 
community. It was an old telephone office, but it was a big room that a carpenter came and put a little partition up again. We had a couch that we stayed, you know, that you put on up at night. And, uh, and uh, for the kitchen there was a curtain, and for, for the closet it was, you know, the whole thing was ridiculous, you know, but we were glad to have it, you know. And, I mean, no, I believe me, nobody now would go into it. Even people on welfare would do it. They would spit in the welfare <laughs> person's, you know, faces, they would offer them that. But we were perfectly yeah, happy. There were cockroaches, of course, and stuff like that. But anyway, and across the hall from this so-called apartment was another little place where the dentist, the Nufin, dentist that lived in Nufin, whom we had met. Okay, across the hall was a little, was a little office that the dentist there, had had, and um, that was Walter's office. And so there was a little tiny waiting room, there's a little couch in there, and then, a, then an examination room, and then a little, um, well, that, that's all it was, then a little drug room or something. Well, in the morning, uh, our friend slept in his room, on the, on the, um, he, took the cushions off the, he took the cushions off the couch and slept on the floor on the cushions. And the office all started at 8 o'clock in the morning. One time, a lady came up the stairs at 8 o'clock, maybe 5 minutes to 8. There was no other way for him to escape. Fred couldn't escape any place at all. He had his pajama on, and he was in this little waiting room. So he quick put all the cushions back on the couch, and he went through the examination room and went into this little drug room that was next to exactly the examination room. He just stayed there. And I told um, Walter, of course, that this person was there, the patient was there. So Walter had saw about four or five patients. Fred was in that little room standing there in his pajama and um, not knowing what to do until, until the patient stopped coming after four or five patients. Nobody came and he quick ran and then he got to rest. I think that's a very funny story. So anyway, a few days after that, he decided to go back to, to go back to, you know, he, he saw that he could get along, he helped us a lot. And then he went, and he drove all the way down to Alabama and saved his grandma. And then he saved his grandma and he got a job in the felt mill, well, not felt mill, paper mill, in a paper mill. And I think there he met your mom. And I think it was kind of love at first sight, somehow or other, because now I went to see, I didn't know anything about that. I went to see you know, my mother and Adolf, and who was that? That was just here. Okay. Well, I was telling them just a little story about what happened to if you lift it up a little bit, so. This got fixed. Yeah. But anyway, I, I, you can just listen to that. You can just go to that. It was a very funny episode. Okay. Your dad had to hide in the closet until the patients were gone because he was sleeping in the little entrance way. And by the time the patient came, he was still sleeping. And then he had, he had no way to get out of his pajama. <laughs> but it was very funny. So then he went, you know, to he went down to Mobile, Alabama, and uh, and and he fell in love. In both of them, I think, was love at first sight. And he showed me a picture of him. mom. And I thought she was gorgeous, but I didn't meet her. And very soon after that, of course, I got married. And you know, grandma was great fun to have anybody get married unless she picked them up, right? I mean, there was not anybody in the whole family. Grandma may she rest in peace, but she didn't like me. Had nothing to do with your mom. She didn't like her co -op? No, of course not. They didn't get along. Oh. Most certainly she didn't like him. He wasn't good enough for me. And then she didn't like uh, her own, her own uh, brother's wife who came. He got married and he came from South America. These are sad stories. But no, she didn't like anyone that she got married to anyone in the family. Nobody was good enough for, for us. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, then you, of course, your, your mom and dad went, went to... I'm, I'm, I didn't meet them until I went to New Orleans. I went to see my mom. And then from there I went to New Orleans to see them after they got married and stayed with them. And they were married and, they, and, and your dad, you know, wanted to show off, of course, his sister's coming, right? And uh, so, so they took me to, uh, oh please, what's the nicest restaurant in, in New Orleans? And it was in a movie. And, okay, I can't remember, but this is ridiculous. I don't know if you feel bad about that. Sometime or other, I'm going to make some notes to this, to this whole thing and tell people. It's just a lovely restaurant. There's nobody in the right mind would go because it's so expensive. But we went there and Roxy, everything was separate. Like, uh, first of all, the waiter comes and, you know, and intimidates you because at that time neither your, your dad or mom or I, I a little bit more, but, but you know, we didn't go just running around restaurants like that. You know, well, you know, we were already established. 
But but any anyway, the way the council on what what could he you know serve you? Could you make suggestions? And Fred said, Yeah, could you make suggestions? Steak, of course. The most expensive is no, so oh yes, that's good, you know. He was so scared of the failure. But then you got the steak and whatever came with it. But every single thing leaving you and so anyway they had breadsticks or they had some sort of vegetables, something. Every single thing was separate. You know, so we ordered that and pretty soon we knew that it was going to be extremely expensive. We didn't know just what to do. And um, okay, but anyway, it was very expensive. And uh, you know, under the table, just not to embarrass Fred, I had ten dollars and I just stuck it in his hand and says, take this one too. Because, you know, we didn't order any dessert. And, in, and I don't remember how much it was, but it was extremely expensive. But in the meantime, as soon as the steak was finished, Doris excused herself and went to the bathroom. And afterwards, she told us, afterwards, lot, lot, I mean, you know, probably after she had the break, she told us that she threw up everything. Because she was pregnant and I didn't have the slightest idea. I was so naive, like, like really ridiculous. Like, she did, took me side saying, you know what else? And, uh, and Doris always says, look daddy, over there, look daddy, over there. I mean, she practically told. But in those days, she didn't say anything about pregnant. She just, it was a big secret. And it didn't occur to me that she was pregnant. So here, Fred spent all his money on this expensive restaurant, on this stay. And he didn't have stayed with Doris more than two minutes. But I guess that was it. I liked it there. They were very nice to me. And, um, and, and, and I, I know that Grandma and Grandpa didn't meet Doris because somehow other they had decided that that, uh, <laughs> that that Doris wasn't wasn't the right wife for Fred. But they decided the same thing with everybody. They had already long, long, not our wife, but Grandma had decided a long time ago that uh, Walter wasn't good enough for me and her own brother Richard's wife, Ria, wasn't good enough for him. And I think there were a few, oh, and our wife had a brother too, Yoji was his name. And they didn't get along with her, this is why. So something, Grandma. Grandma, I'm sure, loved all of us very, very much. But in a wrong way, she just thought she knew a thing better. And so this was just a little story from going to a restaurant and not knowing that your mom was pregnant. And they ordered this, this extremely expensive, you know, steak. And every single thing was actually separate, you know, like, you know, the breadsticks were separate. And so then I, I stuck for $10 under the table because I had it with me. And then I had to say, I can no idea how much it was, but it's expensive. Probably is not too, but especially if you don't have any money. Yeah. So it was really funny. And then and the, your mom kept calling your dad, daddy all the time. Daddy, look at this over there. Daddy, look at that. It didn't occur to me she was right. <laughs> it was that stupid. <laughs> and then finally she told her. She didn't tell me. Hmm. She never told me she was right. You didn't do that in those days. Now, now people tell you, next Saturday we're starting a family, right? First time I heard that, I thought they were crazy. People say that. Wait a second, we're going on vacation next week. But the week before that, we're going to start a family, right? Uh -huh. You know, for sure, the sleep is not so. <laughs> but no, you didn't talk about this. No, she didn't tell me. I know it here. Yeah. I never said, I just mentioned that, you know, my mother had met her, uh, young, young Doris, because she had decided, just like in the same cage as Walter, his, uh, his own brother and own this on that. You know, she did this. All these people went good enough for our royal family. We were the royal family. <laughs> oh, 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 his girlfriends, you know, they, any time that he went out with someone. It was a big, big deal. Grandma didn't like her them either? No, of course not. You don't know that. But she never met uh, Ilka. But no, 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 she did not. You know, she didn't like him. She, she was pretty vocal about that. And he was in Paris with Grandma. Yeah, not on there are lots of fights like that. <laughs> no, she wouldn't, she wouldn't have liked your husband or anybody else's husband as long. As long as they marry into this royal family, they got to be royal, at least. You know. So I think that I did pretty well. You must have.